friends, and welcome to a new era of Conversations with Consequences. We are the ladies of the Catholic Association, bringing you witty and charming, in-depth conversation on the topics that matter to you with the leading thinkers and movers of our time. You may have heard us before locally on the Guadalupe Radio Network or on our podcast, but we're thrilled now to be featured within the entire EWTN radio family on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. We are broadcasting from the Guadalupe Radio Network studios in Washington, D.C., and you can catch us every Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern on your favorite local EWTN affiliate, or you can find us on Sirius XM Satellite Radio Channel 130. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie. And I'm Andrea Pachati bayer Andrea is our legal eagle at the Catholic Association. I'm the uh, medical uh, advisor. I'm a, I'm a, f- a physician. And uh, we have two other ladies that will be joining us on and off uh, at the Catholic Association. Uh, Maureen Ferguson, uh, one of our colleagues at the Catholic Association, is probably one of the sharpest uh, and smartest people on the, that understands the Hill and the pro-life movement. She's been in the trenches, and she moves and shakes with some of our nation's finest lawmakers. Uh, and really, uh, we love talking to Maureen. She always gives us incredible insight. She not always only, knows right? what's going on. She, right? she knows what's going on, <laughs> and she knows how to explain it to us, which is very helpful and important. And the other person that is part of our team is Ashley McGuire, who is a recent convert to the faith, and she also is a brilliant mind, a talented and accomplished author, a pundit, and um, really addresses some of the challenging and knotty issues that all of us are trying to figure out. How, how are we supposed to explain why certain things that seem to be so trendy and so popular are so very wrong? It is. It's hard to navigate these strange cultural times, right? There's a lot going on and a lot we have to know. And the Catholic Association, uh, we exist just exactly for that. We want to be, we are, a faithful Catholic voice in the public square. We talk, uh, we write, we talk, we, we, we appear on TV sometimes talking about um, the religious liberty, the intersection of faith, and politics, all sorts of social issues. We have a very strong focus on the dignity of life, of course, like all Catholics who think deeply about these things. Well, and the, the great thing about all of this is we are super excited about the chance to share what we've learned and bring in talented people that we have uh, a chance to interact with and come into contact with and amplify their message so that our listeners, so you guys out there, are able to have the same understanding with these difficult issues that we do. And that reminds me that our very first show on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network is a conversation with George Weigel, where we're going to be discussing the fate of Australia's Cardinal George Pell. And what else are we going to talk about, Andrea? Oh, goodness. You don't remember? (laughs) George also wrote a fabulous book that we love, uh, talking about modern Catholic history and a thoughtful piece last month for the National Catholic Register, offering advice to all of us Catholics for this coming 2020. We're also going to ask George about his very strong opinions on the Oscar-nominated film The Two Popes. But first, you know, all our listeners are probably, like us, paying close attention to what's going on in China with this coronavirus that has shut down large swaths of that country. I know I'm a little worried about it. I have one of my children is in college, and there are a lot of Chinese international students. They haven't had any infection that I know of yet, but I'm telling my son to wash his hands a lot. But there's other things going on in China besides coronavirus. Right, Andrea? No, absolutely, Gracie. You are correct. And today, February 1st, begins China's new administrative measures for religious groups. And this is a crazy, terrible affront to religious freedom. It's going to control every aspect of religious freedom activity in China. And it's quite shocking. All religions and believers in China are under this new rule. Um, Some of the the aspects are really promoting the Chinese Communist Party, uh, which needs to be acknowledged by all religious groups as the highest authority. And you need to adhere to the directives on religions in China, including the values of socialism. Uh, This means that home churches and any form of underground churches are going to become illegal. 
Well, here at the Catholic Association, we are very concerned with the religious liberty, not just ours, but also our brothers and sisters in other countries like China. And it's, it's a great shame what's going on. Here at the Catholic Association, we really try to make things accessible for, for all of you listeners out there to know what's going on, what's, what we're facing as Catholics here in our country, what our Christian brothers and sisters in areas where they're being persecuted, like in China or in the Middle East, are enduring. And so please look at our, our website, and you can look at some of the wonderful articles written by the TCA women, as well as our media moder- monitoring, where daily we provide a media roundup, and you can learn some of the most important articles to keep you up to speed of what's, what's affecting us today. And that's at thecatholicassociation.org. You can also follow us on Twitter. But now we turn to the meat of our conversation today with our good friend and distinguished senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center here in Washington, D.C. Welcome to Conversations with Consequences, Mr. Weigel. Thank you, Gracie. Nice to be here. And thank you for joining us. I believe this is our third time to have you here in our studio with us, which is very kind of you before when we were just on the Guadalupe Radio Network, but now we are on EWTN as well. And uh, I tend to call that kind of guest a repeat offender, and I'm sure you take no offense. Well, you know, you'd learn to put up (laughs) with a lot from lawyers over the course of a lifetime. That is a very lawyerly term. No one but Andrea would think of repeat (laughs) offender. I find it hilarious. No. When thinking of Mr. Weigel. Well, I watch Blue Bloods tapes every morning on the treadmill, so I'm used to the term repeat offenders. <laughs> Good. Well, I don't think he's an offender. He's a leading Catholic scholar, a prolific author, and a true Christian gentleman. He's wearing his three-piece suit today, but it's not just his, um, it's not just his demeanor. It's also his, uh, his, his, view, his views, which he thankfully shares with all of us in all his many publications. And one of the things that we want to talk to you about um, and something that you've been very anxious to impart uh, to to a listening public is the sad case of Australian Cardinal George Pell, and who recently uh, we I read in one of your um, articles was moved to a, max, a maximum security prison, and his appeal from a conviction for child sexual abuse is going to be heard by the country's highest court next month, I believe, or in March. It's uh, the hearing will be March twelfth and thirteenth, uh, Gracie. Um, the cardinal's uh, situation, uh, I think, physically has improved. Uh, the move to this larger prison outside Melbourne has given him a little more spacious uh, accommodations. Do we call them? Uh, he's got a little more access to fresh air, to being outside. Uh, so I think uh, that's probably a step. Uh, to the good. Uh, Friends who have visited him as recently as the second week of January report him in in very good form. He's leading a very disciplined life of prayer, reading, writing, uh, etc. I think there's been a shift to some degree in the public atmosphere in Australia since uh, we last talked about this, uh, as it has become clearer and clearer that what he was convicted of simply could not have happened. George, uh, a lot of people um, that are listening may not know the details, and, and you and I and Gracie, we've studied because we're concerned about the cardinal, and a lot of we've heard stories about Catholic clergy who have done terrible things, just terrible things. Um, and what's being said about Cardinal George uh, Pell is the same, terrible, but it's incredible. Incredible in that it's not possible. It's literally incredible, Andrea. And this was the the downside of the media blackout that was imposed during the two uh, trials. The first trial, as you remember, ended up in a hung jury. The second trial somehow convicted him on a unanimous 12 to nothing vote. But the public never heard how non-existent the prosecution case was. Mm -hmm. No corroboration of the charges, no real challenge to 20 defense witnesses. So to go back to the high court appeal, I I read the cardinal's lawyer's submission. It was excellent. To the high court. It was, I thought it was devastating. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, (laughs) uh, so I don't know the technical ins and outs of this, but as a a demolition of someone else's argument, Mm -hmm. It, it was outstanding. So 
Uh, I think we have to hope that they're finally going to get it right on this in March. Um, but we have had reason to hope for that before. So intensified prayer is in order, uh, as well as, uh, I think, as many people as possible saying to our friends in Australia, if you don't get this right this time, you are going to be pilloried before the world as a country where the rule of law simply does not apply. George, what do you know about Australia's high court? Is it uh, something analogous to ours? Is it do people speculate? Well, this these were um, appointed by a, a conservative, or these by a liberal, and we're going to expect some kind of shakeout according to that. that that's a good question, Gracie. Uh, I'm no expert on the Australian high court, but uh, judicial uh, and legal friends in Australia tell me that the Australian high court has, in recent years been very skeptical uh, of the judicial process in the state of Victoria, where the cardinal was convicted and where his appeal was rejected. So that's good news. I think it's also good news uh, that the high court is in Canberra, the national capital. It's not in the fetid atmosphere of Melbourne, uh, which is really uh, quite crazy. I mean, <laughs> there's a kind of madness in the air down there. Do you, do you, are you talking about anti-Catholic madness? It's, it, that's part of it, anti-Catholic madness. There's an anti-George Pell madness mm. that has nothing to do with his religious location. Um, uh, a friend of his uh, and a longtime friend of mine who used to run the, uh, the conservative party in Australia, which being at the, on the opposite side of the world is called the Liberal Party. <laughs> That's um, upside down. <laughs> it's on the bottom. Um, uh, told me, he said, you know, George, you have to understand that, that um, Victoria, the state of Victoria makes California look like Alabama. Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, in terms of this hardcore, aggressive, secular, leftist cast of mind, which my friend said over the past 30 years has thoroughly warped the uh, criminal justice system uh, in the state of Victoria. So the point is that getting it out of there and into a mm -hmm. different legal atmosphere uh, and environment uh, should be helpful. In, in thinking about the case involving Cardinal Pell, two ideas came to mind. One, in just doing a, a limited review of Australia, compared to the American legal system. There's a, a heavy, I guess, presumption of um, support in favor of the government, whereas here in America, there are a lot of criminal um, defense rights, de rights for the defendant, and that that may have kind of facilitated a little bit of this overly trusting the prosecution. But then there's this new wrinkle in it, and, and um, in part, because of the abuse crisis that's been um, made n public across across the world, um, to go after any Catholic priest, and I wonder um, what your thoughts are on how the kind of desire to make people whole, make these true victims whole, may have allowed jurors and even the prosecution to kind of suspend the normal rules. Are you talking about like a me too? Uh, a little bit. Kind of thing I mean, where the victim's always right or whoever uh, claims to be a giving, victim giving has to be given. Giving victims more credence than you would normally give, but also a genuine desire to try to stop the pain that, that many of these victims are suffering through a very strong verdict against anybody, you know, somebody, as long as they're affiliated with the Catholic Church. I, I think the relevant legal fact, Andrea, is that after um, a, a royal commission had studied the abuse uh, crisis in Australia, the criminal law in the state of Victoria was changed so that the crown, or what we would call the state, can bring a prosecution simply on the statement, I was abused, by an alleged victim. There need be no corroborating physical mm -hmm. or, or other evidence. Uh, that is deeply problematic. Mm -hmm. And the appeal to the high court has raised that 
uh, point, as it has raised the point, uh, have we forgotten about the presumption of innocence uh, and the ancient common law understanding that to find someone guilty, that finding has to be made without a reasonable doubt. So I think the whole drama of uh, the abuse crisis throughout the world surely bears on this. Um, but I would not overstate that except in this legal point. There were police and judicial authorities uh, and perhaps political authorities in the state of Victoria who were out to get George Pell however they could do it. And this is the tactic they came up with. Mm. Awful. If you're just joining us, um, we're speaking with George Weigel, Distinguished Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center here in Washington, D.C. Um, George, you are a personal friend of Cardinal Pell as well. So you aren't just speaking as somebody who understands the system and the climate of Catholic bias, but you know the man that we're talking about. Um, how long have you known him, and what do you know of his character? Well, I've, uh, George Pell is my oldest friend. Uh, hmm. We met in 1967, uh, which means we've been friends for almost 52 years. I was 16 years old at the time, and he was spending a summer at my home parish in Baltimore in between his ordination uh, from uh, the uh, Urban College of Propaganda in Rome and his doctoral studies at Oxford University in England. Um, the, the relevant point here, Andrea, is, is not simply that I know this man to be a man of, of integrity. The, the relevant point in terms of this larger drama that we were talking about a moment ago is that as the Archbishop of Melbourne, 20 years ago, Cardinal Pell was the first bishop mm -hmm. in Australia to get to grips with the abuse problem, mm -hmm. which had been frankly thoroughly mucked up and indeed in some respects ignored by his immediate predecessor as Archbishop of Melbourne. So there is a profound irony mm -hmm. in the fact that this man who set in motion procedures for dealing with these grave sins and crimes, who reached out to victims, who set up a process for a rational assessment of charges, uh, should be uh, carrying the can for uh, wicked men who had done wicked things that he tried to stop. George, remind us really quickly, uh, remind our listeners if they uh, don't know this or have forgotten, what exactly, what grotesque act Cardinal Pell was accused of. Who accused him and what evidence there is against him? He was him? accused of sexually abusing two altar boys in a sacristy after a mass at the cathedral in Melbourne on a Sunday. In a public, basically a public place. Well, it, this is part of the implausibility of this, is that the Cardinal was never alone mm -hmm. under those they never circumstances. Are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Even my parish priest is never was, alone. <laughs> all of this was supposed to have taken place in about six and a half minutes while well, he was fully vested. I'm not going to describe the physical acts. Uh, this is a family radio yes. network. <laughs> no. uh, but let's that. just say it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense no. uh, uh, at, uh, at uh, all. Well, and, and with and regard there, to the two alleged victims, only one testified. The other has since passed away, and there's issues about him recanting or saying that he had never been Abused, I was correct? struck by the fact that in the Cardinal's appeal to the high court, his lawyers flatly stated that the other yeah. complainant who is deceased had retracted the accusation, which I take it to mean they have some sort of yeah, they have reliable sort of evidence or corroboration uh, for uh, that. Um, so, uh, look, we have to hope that the high court gets this right, as I have written on numerous occasions. Uh, certainly the fate of an innocent man is at stake here, but in a larger context, the reputation of Australia as a country governed by the rule of law is at stake, and if that reputation should be shattered, that is going to be very bad news for Australia's tourist industry, for its international commerce, uh, and I, for one, will be making sure 
that others know this is not a place you can go to safely. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel that's... uh it's a bad thing for all English-speaking countries. I mean, we all all of us, uh, we kind of we, the Western world, all the Western world, <laughs> well, the English-speaking Western world at least, we all sort of share this the same uh, great habits, you no, know, of, of our legal habits of of putting um, guilt and innocence and and determining between them and the rule of law and these are things that we're proud of. I mean, I've lived in Latin America; it's it's different there, right, um, to a certain extent. <laughs> And um, I think it's bad for all of us. And, and don't you think that uh, this could happen anywhere? Or what do you think? Do you think this would happen in the U.S.? Uh, I think it's less likely that a prosecution would be brought on, on this uh, weak uh, case mm-hmm. in, in the United States. But Andrea is right. There is now a, a presumption of guilt when someone brings a charge against uh, a member of the Catholic clergy. And while we understand the emotion that is behind that, uh, it, it doesn't really comport or cohere with what we understand to be the rule of law. And more to the point, this intense focus on Uh, sexual abuse in the Catholic Church is deflecting attention, at least in the American context, from where sexual abuse is a disastrous and chronic habit even today, which is to say in public schools Mm -hmm. and worst of all, in families. Yeah. I mean, what, what, um, yeah, most, most what children are, what, what real data we have on this Mm -hmm. suggests that, that North of fifty percent of this, if not more, takes place within within uh, the family, right. and Tragic especially context. now with the dissolution of the family, the, the the sad state of the family, where young children are growing up with uh, any number of unrelated males living in their households, sure. stepfathers right. and stepboyfriends, and and it puts children at great risk when when you then dis- also destroy the family. Well, that's all true, and that's that's. Uh, somebody mentioned, maybe it was Gracie, it was you, uh, the Me Too movement. Um, the the level of hypocrisy involved in all mm. of this is really quite stunning. Mm-hmm. Uh, Harvey Weinstein seems to be a monster. I yeah. have no problem with that. <laughs> a lot of people who are now jumping on the Harvey Weinstein is a monster bandwagon were perfectly happy. Yeah. to cast a blind eye at what they had to be no, know was going on. Um, and and what's, what's hypocritical about this, I'm afraid, is that people are not willing to face the fact that this kind of sexual predation is a result of the sexual revolution. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That it involves the contraceptive culture, that it involves the abortion license. And until, as a society... We're willing to face that aspect of this. We're going to still well, we're not going our to tails. have. We're not going to have <laughs> yeah. the cultural uh, reform that we require uh, that protects both women and children. Mm-hmm. If you have a culture that uh, celebrates uh, extreme licentiousness, of course, women and children aren't going to be safe in that culture. Of course, women are going to be asked, especially women, but also men are going to be asked to participate in in sexual activities in order to get ahead in the job. This, the, the more you have of this licentiousness, the worse, uh, op- the fewer options women and children are going to have to defend themselves. George, I want to um, just touch on something before we have to take a break. And I have this problem that I always kind of get ahead of myself in thinking about tragic situations and what may come next. And my concern is if and hopefully this doesn't happen, the high court um, doesn't reverse Cardinal Pell's conviction and the conviction stands. What is? What are the options for the Vatican? And I've celebrated, personally celebrated, you know, the Vatican taking a very hard um, response and reaction to uh, founded allegations and substantiated allegations, especially when civil authorities have investigated and and prosecuted this case is different yeah it is and uh, the temptation in some quarters will be uh, to uh, go for an administrative process 
um, okay, we did this to Theodore McCarrick, therefore we have to do this to George Pell. That, that would be catastrophic for the legal reputation of, of the church. Uh, if there is going to be some sort of canonical action against the cardinal, uh, then it has to be in the form of a trial. I don't see how that can happen given mm-hmm. the cast of characters and whatnot. Uh, I do wish that until the um, high court renders it des- its decision, uh, the Vatican press office would stop saying how much it respects the Australian <laughs> judicial system. That's exactly what's on trial right yeah. now. Yeah. And it would be so very true. helpful if they would stop saying that. Uh, that's that's not uh, good, but I, you know, we're going to have to cross that canonical bridge. Uh, well, and hopefully, we don't have to cross day. that no, bridge course, with, course with Cardinal Pella or with any other um, innocent victim of this kind of thing in the future. So, besides prayer, we can also contribute to his defense fund. I know. And yes, uh, that that is absolutely the case, and um, uh, that would be very helpful if people would. Uh, would uh, do that, and um, if people want to contact me, I can explain to them how they can uh, be helpful along those lines. You've been listening to Conversations with Consequences. I'm Dr. Gracie Christie, along with my co-host, the Legal Eagle of the Catholic Association, Andrea picciotti Bayer, and our dear friend, George Weigel. We're going to be switching gears next and looking at not only a message George has for concerned Catholics, but also the new Netflix movie, The Two Popes. And maybe we'll even touch on Cardinal Sara's new book with Pope Benedict. (laughs) And he'll tell us all about it next on EWTN Radio. Welcome back to Conversations with Consequences. We are talking to our good friend, our friend of the show, George Weigel. And we've been talking about the sad case of Cardinal Pell, but we're going to switch gears. And, you know, before we talk about our next topic, I want to mention his wonderful book that I'm, I'm holding a very dog-eared copy. And it's written all over with notes. You'd be very proud of me, George, if you saw my book, because I had to read it with a, with a highlighter. It's, a, it's called The Irony of Modern Catholic History, How the Church Rediscovered Itself and Challenged the Modern World to Reform. It's a very dense book historically in a wonderful way. I realized when I was reading it that I knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> this is good to acknowledge. But tell our listeners about what your book, what is the premise of your book? Because it's fascinating. Well, I'm, I'm, re- I'm trying to retell the story of uh, the church in the modern world, the, the Catholic Church since the French Revolution, how the past 200 and some years have uh, resulted in a great development of Catholic self-understanding. Uh, you're not alone, Gracie, in <laughs> not knowing the story. Okay, so you're, it's me there too. There are an awful lot of people <laughs> well. who, who don't know the story um, because we don't teach the history of the church uh, in Catholic schools, which is a real shame. Uh, I had uh, on the faculty of my college many, many years ago, uh, there was a professor who used to say – he was a history professor – and he would say, history is an antidote to despair. <laughs> Oh. Now, you can interpret that as meaning him saying, in a subtle way, things have always been worse. So, <laughs> so Pick any time in human bit. history. <laughs> um, but I think it is true because uh, without a sense of historical perspective, when we get into a moment like the present one in the Catholic Church where, you know, things are getting a little rocky in the boat and the air turbulence is mm-hmm. high and the seas are getting a bit choppy – uh, if you don't understand that that's more or less normal, mm-hmm. you're going to freak out. <laughs> and freaking out is not a uh, good way uh, to enter into a serious reflection about what's needed to steady the boat and, and get it through the storm. The, the two big points I'm trying to make in this book is that first, this complicated and often confrontational – uh, relationship between the church and and the modern world, which began with popes like Gregory the Sixteenth and Pius the Ninth hurling mm-hmm. anathemas against mm-hmm. modernity in all its forms, 
paradoxically, ironically, and I would say providentially, ended up with the church rediscovering the truth about itself, that it's not an institution to be maintained. It's a community, a communion of disciples in Mm -hmm. mission whose task is to convert the world. And if this book helps us understand that we live in apostolic times, Mm -hmm. not in Christendom times, Mm -hmm. if I can put it that way, and that each one of us has a has a vocation as a missionary disciple, then that'll be uh, I'll regard that as a su- su- successful outcome for the book. The other big point I'm trying to make is that the Catholic Church has developed an understanding of what it takes to make a modern democratic society with a market-centered economy, uh, living plurality, work. Uh, We see this in the social doctrine of the church, uh, particularly in the social doctrine of John Paul II, a a vision of the free and virtuous society that a Western world, which is basically crumbling now Mm -hmm. under the impacts of a whole lot of nonsense that Mm -hmm. in one way or another goes back to false understandings of what a human person is, what a human community is, what solidarity means what real beatitude is. We've got something to say to that. And we've evolved that over the past several hundred years, and we need to be more effective in proclaiming that vision of the free and virtuous society of the third millennium and the 21st century uh, to the world. So that's part of the package here as well. So if I could rephrase, it's in grappling with modernity that the church achieves or learns the ways to uh, re-evangelize the world, the modern world. The church has been compelled by the secularization of modernity Mm -hmm. to rediscover the essential truth about itself, Mm -hmm. which is Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go and make disciples of all nations. Mm -hmm. The Lord did not say go and build a big infrastructure of Mm -hmm. institutions. (laughs) The institutions are important because they are launch pads for mission. But mission comes first. That's, that's, what, that's what's going on here. And that, that it took this contentious relationship between the church and modernity to help us rediscover something that was always there in the history of the church and that always enlivened the most vibrant eras in the history of the church, uh, I regard as a providential uh, irony. George, I would, I would just encourage all of our listeners to pick up the book. I devoured it. I loved it. And, um, and I wanted to say one thing when we were talking about um, the ignorance that I also confess in church history. Um, I had a chance to write a book review on, on your lovely book, and one of my kids, who's 14, was looking at one of the drafts and said, Mom, you made a total mistake. And I said, what? He said, you called it Leo the Twelfth. It's Leo the <laughs> Thirteenth. So there is hope. There is hope, and it's called The Next Generation. And um, But I also would say in, in your book, I almost kind of want to rename it Be Still, Be Still. We're, we're, as Catholics, faithful Catholics, we're definitely, the boat is being rocked a lot. And towards the end, the greatest charge and the best advice you gave to me, and I think to all readers, is follow the guidance of John Paul II, live our faith. Well, and be not afraid. Uh, Ultimately, God is in charge of all this. And while it may be very difficult at certain moments in in Catholic history, uh, perhaps including this one, uh, to understand, okay, Lord, what are you up to here? What's going on here? We have to retain the conviction that the Lord is finally in charge of history and that if parts of history make us a little more uncomfortable than we might otherwise be or would like to be. Uh, There's a reason for that, Mm -hmm. too. So, George, talking about books and what God is up to, tell us what you think God is up to with this latest book scandal from the book From the Depths of Our Hearts by Cardinal Sara and uh, and Pope Benedict as co-author. There's a big brouhaha brewing. <laughs> Maybe it's happening at a level where many of our listeners aren't, aren't paying attention, but it's real. So tell us what you think about uh, this. I think the listeners would have to be in a cave <laughs> 500 feet under 
Death Valley not to <laughs> be be aware of this. Um, Maybe they just look, are home with a lot of children. All of this, all of this fuss, which is embarrassing and in some respects disturbing, and it's even silly, um, is distracting attention from what's really serious here, which is the substance of the book. The book makes a very powerful argument in two different ways. Pope Benedict in his biblical scholar theological way, Cardinal Sara in his theological pastoral way. They both make a very strong case that to think of celibacy as simply a kind of optional discipline is to miss the whole point. The celibate priesthood and episcopate is a reflection of the kingdom dimension of the church. It's a, a fancy theological term is eschatological character of the church. The church is Im, the church embodies here and now, as the Lord himself said, the kingdom of God is among you. And the total self-gift of priests and bishops to the church uh, is a reflection of that. And you can't really grasp the meaning of celibacy if you think of priesthood simply as a function. Mm -hmm. If priests are simply what priests do, then, you know, why not any kind of uh, person in this functional role? Uh, if priests, on the other hand, in the Catholic Church, embody in a unique way uh, Christ's relationship to the church as his bride— Mm -hmm. then uh, that leads us down a, a rather different and, and quite dramatic uh, path. Uh, that's what's at stake in this celibacy argument. And both Pope Benedict and, and Cardinal Sara, both of whom I am happy to say are friends with whom I was discussing these matters just two months ago mm -hmm. in, in Rome, uh, emphasize that if you, ha if you, if you turn the priesthood uh, simply into a set of functions— like a nine-to-five job, right? Then you turn the church into an NGO, mm -hmm. into a non-governmental organization. And there was a sense in at the Amazonian Senate this past October, uh, during which, as I say, I met with both the Pope Emeritus and with my friend Cardinal Sara. Uh, there is a sense in that that was – there's a sense that that was perhaps one of the deepest issues at stake in this Amazon. As though, as though the church had a list, of, a laundry list of things it had to achieve in the area, and so we just need um, hands to come and do it, but whoever it does, the hands but are. But the laundry list didn't begin with converting right. indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. you, had a, you know, had a missionary had to bishop there. feed them and house them and clothe them. Who, and who's bragging about the fact that he never uh, baptized an indigenous oh. person in 35 oh. years. I'm going to interrupt real quick just because maybe some of our listeners have just turned in, uh, tuned in, and I want to remind them that that you're listening to Conversations with Consequences, the radio show of the Catholic Association, and we are delighted to have one of our dear friends, George Weigel, with us. We've been discussing a little bit the controversies of um, that have been kind of uh, generated with the book written by Cardinal Robert Sarah and uh, Benedict um, the Sixteenth from the depths of our hearts. And I was wondering. Um, you mentioned something that I, I think hits the nail on the head, which is people have a hard time today, uh, us moderns, appreciating fidelity. And maybe some of the opposition and pushback to the notion of celibacy, and maybe some of the pushback to the notion of ordained priests instead of bringing people on as functionaries, is that people can't wrap their heads around true fidelity to a vocation. I, I don't know if that's been something, but I, I know that if we think going back to our earlier conversation about the abuse crisis at the core is a lack of fidelity. These perpetrators were not faithful themselves, but it doesn't mean it's not possible. Well, this is, the po this is a major point that uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict and, and Cardinal Sara make, make in this book. Uh, it's a point if I may say, that I have been making for almost 18 years now. Men who believe themselves to be what the Catholic Church teaches they are as priests, namely icons, living icons of the eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ, 
do not behave the way abusers behave. That, that, that's mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. the fundamental bottom line uh, of all of this. It would be anathema words. to them. And there was a, a moment uh, that, that is uh, tracks with this huge spike in, in clerical sexual abuse uh, um, in the late, from the late 60s to the late 1980s. Where, where priesthood was understood in largely functional terms mm-hmm. rather than iconic terms. The term of art in those days, when I was teaching in the seminary in Seattle in the mid-1970s, was priestcraft. Craft. And, a, you know, a fellow Sounds faculty horrible. member of mine who's a very distinguished moral theologian said, what's that all about? I mean, first of all, it's too close to witchcraft. And, yeah, and then right. secondly, we're not talking about craft here, uh, fundamentally. We're talking about uh, supernatural vocation. Supernatural vocation. <laughs> yeah, it's not like making beers in your basement. It, putting <laughs> on Jesus Christ in a unique uh, way. Uh, craft beer had not emerged <laughs> in, in Seattle in those days. That was on the horizon of yuppie happily, consumption. Happily in the horizon. <laughs> but that's the same. It's, it's the same uh, when when we lose sight of the priest as 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 uh, embodying G- Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ for us. Then we also lose sight of why priests should be men, right? We lose. Sure. Uh, look, if 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 you live as we do in what's essentially a unisex culture, in which our differentiation as male and female is essentially a plumbing matter, mm-hmm. not in any, any deep revelation mm-hmm. of That's truths right. built into us, then you're not going to get um, the Catholic Church's insistence that it can only ordain men to the, uh, to the priesthood. Um, but this is part of a larger uh, set of cultural confusions. And, and to connect this, if I may, discussion to what we were talking about a moment ago with, with my book, this is part of the challenge that the Catholic Church mm-hmm. places to the modern world uh, or puts before the modern world. If you dumb down uh, our being easy. made male and female, both equal in the image of God, but both but different in... In, uh, in our maleness and femaleness and their complementarity and their fruitfulness. If you, get, if you lose all of that, you're going to make a mess of society. And we see that all We're around us. That. Think mm-hmm. of the Kavanaugh confirmation mm-hmm. hearings a few blocks from where we're sitting here in Washington today. There was something really almost demonic. No, I was going to say it was, was totally demonic. What was going people on screeching and during that. I mean, just completely untoward behavior. Well, this is what happens when you kind of lose your grasp on, on the truth of things. So anyway, mm-hmm. um, lots of issues. The, the important point about the Benedict uh, Sara book is read the book. Uh, mm-hmm. Don't get caught up in all of this uh, media contention about who wrote what and what the cover was supposed to look like and and well, what have you. It's clear, I have read the book, it's absolutely clear that the first chapter is the work of Joseph Ratzinger, it couldn't mm-hmm. be anybody else. Um, so who, you know, let's move on to the, yeah, to the to substance. The substance. Let's get absolutely. to the substance and see what, what can can be done with that. And what what do you have to tell us about the Two Popes movie? Should we watch that? And what should we bring to the, our watching? Well, it's, uh, it's brilliant acting, uh, and the script is complete baloney from stem <laughs> to stern. Uh, <laughs> the, the movie says at the beginning, um, based on actual events, like and the, I were said to people, people you know, there were people <laughs> named Bergoglio and Ratzinger. That, that's true. and not make up those names. That's about it. Um, in my Catholic Press column today, January 15th, I have, a, uh, have some comments on this. And I, look, it's uh, Anthony Hopkins is a fantastic actor. Jonathan Price is a fantastic actor. Um, that should not... Uh, mitigate against people understanding this is complete fiction. Mm -hmm. None of this happened. And there's an agenda here, or there seems to be an agenda here. And that is to suggest that there was a frustrated 
minority at the conclave of 2005 that wanted to turn the church 180 degrees from the teaching of John Paul II. Uh, that frustrated minor minority became a majority at the conclave of 2013, convinced the rest of the College of Cardinals that we needed a 180 degree turn from John Paul II and Benedict XVI. That is just simply false. I was there on both of those occasions. I was in intense conversation with cardinal electors. That's just false. Uh, cardinal Bergoglio was elected uh, because he was presented as a tough-minded, no-nonsense reformer who would clean house in the Vatican, period. That's what would the conclave of 2013 was Not about. to turn the church on her head. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's the implication of the movie. Well, it and seems like a, a palace intrigue kind of thing. We're all obsessed with whether the prince and princesses in England are going to be connected or not. We should think the same with the church, and the church just isn't that. It doesn't work that way. And uh, while there are some very touching moments in, in the film, uh, it, it's all fiction. So, uh, and I say that with complete confidence because I know the two men, mm -hmm. I know the events, I lived through the events, and it's all fiction brilliantly acted fiction, but as I <laughs> said in this column, this has as much to do with the people I know and the events I lived through as the rise of Skywalker. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's just out there in fantasy land. Brilliant fantasy land, but fantasy land nonetheless. George, we can't thank you enough for your time today. Um, you've shed such tremendous light on the situation facing dear Cardinal Pell. And with his appeal before Australia's high court, I uh, can't impress upon all of our listeners to pray and, like Mr. Weigel mentioned, reach out if you have the ability to help support his defense. Um, you've inspired us also to become those missionaries at the retail level. I think we're going to go back to our parishes and to our communities and through our families and our friendships and try to actually live what Christ is calling us to live and be the Catholics that God has asked us to be spreading the gospel and, and doing our best to live it, and maybe choosing different movies to watch if we have the choice. I haven't looked at the other Oscar lineups, but I think I'll choose those instead. If you're interested in following George Weigel's work, visit eppc.org. And if you haven't read his book, The Irony of Modern Catholic History, make sure you order it. Um, it's available at your local bookstore and, of course, on Amazon, like everything else. Thank you so much, George Weigel, for joining us again. It was a distinct pleasure. Thanks for having me. As we wind down the hour here, next we hear a beautiful homily from Father Roger Landry ahead of the Mass on Sunday. We hope this leaves you inspired, and we also hope that you'll catch us next week when we talk with Mary Hassan, head of the Catholic Women's Forum and the Gender Ideology Guru, with a look at the real social climate in public schools these days. Catch us every Saturday at 5 p.m. on your EWTN local affiliate or check us out at thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts. This is Father Roger Landry, and part of every episode of Conversations with Consequences involves focusing on the consequential conversation Jesus wishes to have with us each Sunday. This Sunday, we'll celebrate the great feast of the presentation of the baby Jesus in the temple, a feast that generally happens on Sunday only once every six years or so. So most, except daily mass goers, almost never have a chance to celebrate it. But it has so much to teach us as believers about Jesus and about how Jesus wishes to act in our life. The point of the feast is summarized in the beautiful instructions that the Church prays at the beginning of Mass, just before we process with candles. It features that the point of the presentation is so that we might encounter Christ, just like Simeon and Anna, and find him and recognize him until he comes again revealed in glory. Jesus is constantly being presented to us, and we're called to be constantly presenting ourselves to him, the Christian life is meant to be a continuous mutual presentation, a lifetime encounter of life and love. And that encounter is supposed to happen when we're young, when we're adults, and when we're seniors. We can focus a little on each of those three. The Feast of the Presentation has so much to teach seniors, because we see in Simeon and Anna a model for the way to live our later years. 
we can ask the important question among the tens of thousands of people at the temple the day Jesus was presented. Why were these two the only to recognize that the child being held in Mary's arms was the long-awaited Messiah? The reason is because they were in the temple differently than everyone else. They were waiting for the Lord there, longing for him, expecting him with hearts and minds made pure. They had been cooperating with the Holy Spirit who led them to the temple that day precisely because of their hunger. Simeon took Jesus in his arms, praised God, and presented him not just to Israel as her glory, but to all the nations as their light. And Anna, as soon as she saw Jesus, began to praise God and speak of him to all who were looking for the redemption he had come to bring into the world. They show us that the best way to use our later years is to grow closer to the Lord, to encounter him in prayer, to encounter him in mass, to encounter him in sacrificial love. Simeon's words, Now, O Lord, let your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Words that each of us should want to say at the end of our life when the Lord Jesus returns for us. The vespers of our life, they teach us. It's a time to speak of God to others, to pass on real wisdom, to present the Lord to those who don't see his presence, and to show how he is the light shining in the midst of so much darkness. What does this feast teach young adults and couples, especially those with young children? Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to present their child to God. In the law of Moses, every firstborn child was to be given over to God, placed in his service, sacrificed to him. This was to show that every gift comes from God, and every gift needs to be willing to be given back to God for his glory. Mary and Joseph, fulfilling perfectly the law of Moses, came to offer Jesus back. And God the Father wants every child to be offered back to him in Christ. That starts when, as a young couple, they bring their newly baptized, newly born child to be baptized. The child is, in a sense, placed in the Lord's service. The child dies to the old Adam, and Christ rises from the dead. The child is not merely presented in the temple, but becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit, like a tabernacle holding the presence of God within. Parents are called continuously to offer their children over to God, like on that blessed day. Finally, we turn to what every child of God, especially young people, can learn from this feast. Each of us has been presented in the temple by our parents and godparents, and we were consecrated. We're called to renew that consecration at every Mass. The presentation is often called Candlemas, or Mass of Candles, because it begins with a procession of candles. This is meant to renew something very important from our baptism. When our godparents lit our baptismal candle from the Paschal candle, said, receive the light of Christ, and we were instructed to keep that light burning brightly. Jesus is a light of revelation to the Gentiles. He was the light of the world, has made us capable of reflecting that light from the inside out. And we will process with candles as a sign that we're called to walk as children of the light, to walk together as God's family to that place where Jesus will be the lamp lighting the eternal city. So whether we're young or old, tomorrow we will give thanks to God for the Feast of the Presentation, come to a culmination so much greater than what Simeon and Anna received. They had a chance to hold Jesus in their arms. We have a chance to receive Jesus within so that he can continue that encounter on the inside. We will receive the glory of Israel. We will be filled with the light of revelation to the nations. How lucky we are that the same Holy Spirit who moves him in and into the temple will move us to go to recognize Jesus, to rejoice in Jesus, to receive Jesus, and to be formed by him to reveal his light and his love to the world. God bless you all.